Hey there, welcome to the Achievable Podcast. I'm Brandon Rith, content creator for the financial exam prep courses on Achievable, where we currently offer support for FINRA licensing exams like the SIE exam. We just recently released our Series 7 program, now available for you to try for free. The material is written in a down-to-earth, easy, and fun-to-read style, comes with over 4,000 practice questions, and integrates smart technology that analyzes your progress to create an ongoing custom study plan. You can gain full access to the first chapter, which is on common stock, by going to achievable.me. That's achievable.me. That's a great segue into today's topic, which is what to expect on the Series 7 exam. Uh, I assume most of you who are listening to this podcast either have a test date in the future or maybe are planning on taking the test or might be exploring this exam. Uh, Either way, the information we'll cover today should help you no matter what. If you're thinking about taking the exam, this will give you an idea of what to expect in terms of your study process. And for those of you who are going to take the exam, this should give you a good idea of what to specifically focus on. That's actually the main focus of our podcast today, which is to make sure that you know the most tested areas on this exam. First, let's talk about what the exam is and what it accomplishes. Known as the General Securities Representative Exam, the Series 7 is a FINRA-administered licensing exam for people entering into the securities industry. And by the way, if you don't know what a security is, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things like those are securities. And a lot of times you can use the word investment as a synonym or replacement for the word security. FINRA, which is the organization that is responsible for administering this Series 7, is the financial industry regulatory authority. And on top of administering the Series 7, they essentially regulate large portions of the investment markets. And one of their more important functions is licensing and registration of representatives. If you want to work in the securities industry, you'll have to pass a number of financial exams just like the Series 7. The exams you'll take are contingent on what you'll actually end up doing in the industry, but passing these exams demonstrates you know what you're talking about when discussing the financial markets and specific investments with clients, which can be a really complex type of conversation. And finance is a really important aspect of our lives. It it helps us save for our children's college expenses, fund our retirements, start small businesses, or even fund charitable efforts. And that is by no means the end of the list. Those are just maybe a couple things off the top of my head. We don't want people who don't understand securities or how finance works in general bumbling their way through discussions with clients. And that is one of the main goals of these licensing exams is to avoid that type of situation. Most people that sit for the Series 7 will also be required to take the SIE exam, which most of you will probably take actually prior to the Series 7. And in addition, state licensing exams like the Series 63 or 66 are typically required as well. And we will cover those exams in another podcast. The Series 7 license is kind of the gold standard in regards to financial licenses. If you've ever watched a financial movie like Wolf of Wall Street or Boiler Room, the Series 7 is the only license they discuss in those movies, and that is by design. If you want to be a stockbroker, financial advisor, trader analyst, or even a wealth manager, or anything that sounds similar to those types of jobs, you're most likely going to have to pass the Series 7 exam. Let's now pivot to what the exam actually covers. The Series 7 is a 135-question exam, but only 125 of those questions will count towards your final score. FINRA always includes extra questions in their exams that they deem experimental. These exam questions are just ones that they're trying out most of the time to see how you answer them, and they might introduce them to a future exam as an actual test question. Uh, Now, the problem is that you won't know which questions are which, and uh, those questions don't count for you or against you, so there's literally no point in even worrying about these questions. At the end of the day, you only need to worry about being graded on 125 test questions. You must score 72% or higher in order to pass this exam, which means you'll need to answer 90 of those 125 questions correctly, or at least for the most part. FINRA does this weird thing with all of their exams, which I call scaling for difficulty. The following language I'll quote directly from FINRA's website. Quote, 
Your test score is placed on a common scale with all other candidate test scores for that exam, and statistical adjustments are made to the score to account for slight variations in the difficulty that may exist among different sets of exam questions. There's an element of randomness with FINRA exams, and you could end up with a very difficult or even a very easy exam, both of which are within the realm of possibilities. If you're given a very difficult exam, there is a silver lining. Your grade will be scaled upward and vice versa, meaning that if you were giving a very easy exam, hey, you got to watch out because that grade might be scaled downward. So for example, if it still doesn't make sense, you could potentially score a 65% on what Fenric deems as a very difficult exam and end up with a pass as your final result, even though the passing score is 72%. This is how FINRA justifies making the test as equal as possible for any given person that sits for the exam. We don't know how much the scale influences the exam grading. This is something that FINRA doesn't disclose, and I don't expect them ever to disclose it. But I have a hunch that it could be significant if a test is significantly difficult. The reason I say that is just from my experience of helping people on this exam. Uh, one of the most common forms of feedback I get from my students regarding this test is uh, something like, uh, that, that was the most difficult exam I ever took. I, 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 was, I swear I was going to fail the exam, but I hit the submit button and I actually passed. And here's the thing. I, I think they're right. I, I, I don't think this is a misjudgment of the exam or, or even test anxiety fueling your perspective of the exam. Uh, I, I think people are really getting very advanced sets of questions, but the grading of the exam compensates for the difficulty, again, to make it fair to, for everyone. This is actually a very important thing to be aware of for all FINRA exams. One of the biggest pitfalls test takers fall into is losing confidence mid-exam. Now, let's just picture it. Imagine yourself in the test center. You prepare for this exam for months. Uh, you're, you think you're ready. You think you've studied all the right things. You sit in your chair. You start the exam. The first few questions seem pretty difficult, uh, but you know, you're know you sure it's just the first couple questions that you're seeing, and maybe that's just a a curveball you're being thrown right from the start. But 50 questions in, you realize that every single question you've been given is not easy, and most of them are significantly difficult. Some people, unfortunately, fall apart at this point. They start thinking about all the, you know, what I call the I just failed conversations. They imagine having that conversation with their boss, their family, their friends, uh, the reality is that most people will talk about studying for this exam, mainly because it takes so many hours out of your life. So of course, your boss will know about it if you work in the industry, but you're going to tell your family, you're going to tell your friends, you're going to tell your neighbors, and no one wants to come back from that exam telling those people that they failed. It is no judgment of someone's character or how smart they are. In fact, I'd say most people that end up failing the series seven, it's just because they either didn't approach their study process in the right way or didn't give themselves enough time. Failing an exam that your career hinges on and that most of the people you know are aware of that you're taking, it just kind of rubs salt a little bit into the wound. The best thing that you can do is to not let those thoughts creep in. And I know that's not an easy thing to do. If you mentally give up in the middle of the exam, you're not going to be paying attention closely to the other questions that you have to go through. For those of you who have studied this exam and have seen practice questions relating to the Series 7, you know that these are very nitpicky questions. Sometimes one word can change everything in the question. The questions are also written in a real difficult, in a tricky way. So you need to be on top of the ball in order to get through a majority of these questions and answer them correctly. This exam requires every ounce of brain energy to pass, and you must pay attention to the details. Here's the thing that you'll need to remember. You're almost always doing better than you think you are because of the curve. Okay, let's do a quick recap of what we just talked about before we get into the actual material on the exam. There are 135 test questions on the Series 7 exam. 125 of those test questions will count towards your actual grade. You must score 72%, and there is a curve for difficulty. Now, let's break down the exam specifics. FINRA breaks down the Series 7 exam into four distinct categories, which I'll use to guide us. 
a whopping 91 questions or 73% of the exam is dedicated to one category. It's this category. And I'll quote from FINRA's language. Quote, provides customers with information about investments, makes recommendations, transfers assets, and maintains appropriate records. That's FINRA speak there. Let me translate that to you uh, in plain English. This section is basically suitability. Suitability refers to making suitable investment recommendations to clients given their financial situation, investment objectives, and goals. It may sound simple, but the questions on this topic are some of the most difficult questions on the exam. Let's break down all you'll need to know to succeed in this category. First, you'll need to think about securities using what I call BRTI. And this is something that you'll see us mention over and over again in the Achievable Series 7 program. BRTI is benefits, risks, and typical investor of different products. Now, when I say products, I mean securities, I mean investments, and there are a lot of them that we need to be aware of for the exam. Let's go through the BRTI of one of the more frequently discussed securities in the exam being common stock or what most people would just refer to as stock. So let's start with the B, the benefits. What are the benefits of common stock? Well, they offer growth, also known as capital appreciation, which basically means that you can buy these at low prices and hopefully sell them at high prices later. And also some stocks pay dividend income, which is literally cash to investors just for holding their stock. Those are two great benefits of common stock. Next, let's talk about the R, the risks of common stock. Well, there are systematic, also known as market-wide risks, like market risk. You know, that's basically when the market completely falls apart due to some circumstance or event. You know, the market crash in 2008 or coronavirus in March 2020 are examples of market risk. There are also non-systematic risks that apply to specific businesses at a time, like business risk, which is the risk that you just can't sell your products, financial risk, the risk that the company borrowed too much money, Regulatory risk, that's where the government threatens regulation or introduces regulation, which costs the company money. And even liquidity risk, which is the risk that a security will be difficult to sell. And that is especially prevalent for unlisted stocks. Uh, and that's basically a stock that does not trade on an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. And last, what about TI, the typical investor? Common stock investors are typically young and have long time horizons. This is mostly due to the risk involved with these investments. Uh, the stock market is kind of like a roller coaster, uh, especially if you've watched it at all in 2020. And you definitely want to make sure the people that are primarily putting lots of money in that, those types of investments can survive that type of risk and have time to recoup losses in case we run into a multi-year bear market, which basically means that the market is going down over a long period of time. So that was BRTI, Benefits, Risks, Typical Investor of Common Stock. And you'll want to be comfortable with the BRTI of all the major securities tested on this exam. And these include preferred stock, in addition to common stock, corporate debt, convertible securities, municipal securities, U.S. government securities, mortgage-backed securities, bank products like CDs, uh, mutual funds, closed-in funds, exchange-traded funds, exchange-traded notes, REITs, also known as real estate investment trusts, hedge funds, uh, direct participation programs like oil and gas limited partnerships, and even options. And that's not even the full list, unfortunately. Those are just the most commonly discussed securities on the exam. Of the securities that I just listed, two of them are especially important given the number of times they're mentioned on FINRA's outline, and that is municipal securities and options. Let's start talking about municipal securities first, which are investments that are offered by state governments, city governments, and local governments. Basically, any level of government that is lower than the federal government. Municipalities offer a wide range of securities, which include general obligation bonds, revenue bonds, double barrel bonds, industrial development bonds, special tax bonds, special assessment bonds, anticipation notes, 529 plans, and that's not it. Those are just the most commonly discussed municipal securities. Not only could you be tested on the characteristics and suitability of these products, but also the issuance of these securities. Prior to selling these investments, municipalities follow specific protocols that you must know and be comfortable with in order to answer the majority of those questions correctly. 
Options are derivative investments that make returns for investors that make bets on market movements. For example, a long call investment, which is an option, is a bet that market prices are going to go up. And if they go up, you make money. There are several option strategies that are commonly tested, which include single leg strategies, hedging strategies, income strategies, straddles, and spreads. With these option strategies in particular, you want to feel really comfortable with how they work, You know what's the math behind it, meaning what's the maximum gain, what's the maximum loss, what's even the break even, what happens in the market price goes here or there. You want to feel really comfortable with those topics. Also, you'll want to feel comfortable with the suitability of options as well, because you will likely see questions from that area. Now, let's bring it back to the big picture view. General suitability municipal securities, and options will likely be the majority of your exam given the number of times these topics are mentioned on FINRA's Series 7 outline. You should absolutely make it a priority to master these topics as much as possible prior to testing. The rest of the exam is a bit of a crapshoot, unfortunately. There are three other test categories which collectively represent 34 test questions or about 27% of the exam. 14 test questions or 11% of the test comes from, quote, obtains and verifies customers' purchase and sales instructions and agreements, processes, completes, and confirms transactions, unquote, category. And yeah, that's FINRA speak again. So let's break it down. What does that actually mean? Testable topics in this category include order types, uh, like market orders, limit orders, stop orders, stop limit orders, You'll also need to know the components of order tickets and how those are generally submitted into the system. Short sales, uh, best execution requirements for broker-dealers, and also margin accounts. Uh, Those are those accounts where you borrow money to make investments into the market, also known as leveraging. Of the previously mentioned topics, order types and margin are likely to be the most heavily tested topics within this category. 11 questions, or 9% of the exam, comes from the, quote, opens accounts after obtaining and evaluating customers' financial profile and investment objectives, unquote, category. Testable topics in this category include types of accounts, like prime brokerage accounts. Also, account registrations like individual, joint, uh, trust, uh, custodial. Retirement plans like IRAs and 401ks and 403bs. Supervisory systems that are implemented at, at, at your place of business. Things like that. Of the previously mentioned topics, account registrations and retirement plans are likely to be the most heavily tested topics within this category. And one more to go, one more category. Nine questions or 7% of the exam comes from the quote, seeks business for the broker dealer from customers and potential customers, unquote, category. Testable topics within this category include public communications like correspondence, retail communications, and institutional communications. Uh, disclosures on advertisements made to the public, the new issue process, like initial public offerings, uh, and exempt transactions like Regulation D or Regulation A. Of the previously mentioned topics, public communications and the new issue process are likely to be the most heavily tested topics in this category. And that's your summary for what to expect on the Series 7. As we've discussed, this is a very difficult exam. It covers literally hundreds of different topics, that may take you several weeks or months to prepare for. And you should make sure that you're using the best resources available out there. And uh, Achievable for the Series 7, which again, I personally wrote content for, is available right now, which is absolutely free for you to try. Go to achievable.me, that's achievable.me, to gain access. No payment required, no credit card required, no debit card required. All you need is your email address, and we'll give you access to the first chapter alongside with a bunch of practice questions and exam questions completely for free for you to try. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope that the information conveyed and shared in this podcast will help you prepare for this test uh, as efficiently and effectively as you possibly can. And we're going to have more podcasts coming out soon. Uh, This is going to be a priority not only for basic wisdom, but also achievable in the near future. So please be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you found this. Uh, We're on on probably, uh, I think, 15 different platforms at this point. And it should be pretty easy for you to not only uh, find us again, but also to recommend to your friends, subscribe, 
all that stuff. The more you pay attention to us, the more free content we can give you. So uh, again, thank you for listening. Take care. Good luck with your studies and we'll see you soon.